We've got dual whiteboarding. Yeah, dual going whiteboarding. On. Now we're good. Right. Pictionary. All right. <laughs> All right, what's the clue? What's the clue? <laughs> this side's on my team. <laughs> So one of the big opportunities I think that we have in a non-direct sales uh, channel is the RPM difference between a direct sales campaign and then a, either a programmatic or just a standard exchange uh, execution. We have so many more opportunities for monetization in a direct sales side where you know programmatic and exchange is so far behind that that it takes, away, it takes a lot of the focus away from actually using those channels. Um, we're very heavy on, on direct sales. I mean, we're, um, you know, we've got the capacity on sell-through to do more on programmatic and exchange, but the upside just doesn't always warrant it. So do you, uh, within CBS, are you CBS local or CBS interactive? CBS interactive. So w what are you guys doing with regards to kind of like, do you use multiple solutions as well as programmatic? Do you have you know, Pubmatic and Rubicon and AdX? Do you have multiple solutions plugged in on the back end? Yeah, but we, we, it, we, use, we barely run programmatic. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the same thing everyone's been talking about, how, how difficult it is to actually execute it. So does that mean then that you just have, you have impressions that go unmonetized? Uh, no, I mean everything go everything ends up going through the exchange. Okay. Um, but you know our CPMs, uh, you know depending on where they are, they're either cratering or you know hovering around something that is just right above zero. Yeah. I mean you know they're not great. So. Are you seeing advertisers request to go that way? Uh, the ones that you've had a long relationship with uh, direct, but they're asking to go to the programmatic channel and then asking for concessions in CPM. Uh, yeah, we have seen that. Um, you know, our our biggest focus is on uh, like we're going we're we're making a big commitment to like branded content, native, you know, super customization, spending a lot of effort there, so that there is a a big distinction between the value that direct sales provides and what people can get out of programmatic or the exchange. I know for us, what we the way we've been looking at it is for what we are putting in the programmatic space. You know, those are things that you're not going to, uh, we're, we're not putting those, the high value opportunities that you're going to buy in the direct, whether they're sponsorship or native or not, even just standard placements, but if they're high value, high importance, we're just not exposing them. And we're having a very good success for our advertisers holding that line and understanding the difference in the value. Obviously, I mean, but you know, somebody at a conference, it might have been from Index Exchange or some other at a conference I sat at, he's like, you know, could you stop commenting because you guys have champagne problems because you're an endemic, you're, you're, you're so dedicated to so many, to, to such a, uh, a small set of customers, and, and he was right. And so it is a little bit difficult to, you know, put ourselves in the same shoes. But I, I think we've got a, a pretty good approach from our business development team in looking at what's going on programmatically and trying to find those non-endemic advertisers that we think we can add more value to, and moving them into direct sales or PMPs, and then into direct sales. And they, they doubled revenue last year doing that, and they killed it. And it was, you know, a strategic choice to to kind of do that. And you know, so I, when I talk to people, I always say, you know, try to give that a shot. Um, just to see if you can find it. I mean, uh, Allstate told me one time they didn't like the concept of people mining the exchange and saying no. And I said, but what if we don't say no and we just try to help add value to you other ways? And they're like, okay, we're, we're fine with that. And I think if you just do it smart, but it, it is a challenge when you have a much more varied advertiser base to be able to get scale at that. So I might not be very helpful at all. <laughs> I'll say this though, and most of the, most of the exchange, open exchange environments <laughs> actually have like a, a very precipitous drop in their kind of CPM curve. They, you know, you hear the, well, we have advertisers that are bidding $20, right? And you get three of them, right? It really is a precipitous drop from the high CPM, super valuable targets they're going after to everything else. And so that's one of the reasons that we like working with multiple exchanges is because then you actually get access to all of those small chunks at high CPM. So you. You push the top end of the curve out to the right, and your precipitous drop comes later. Um, that between that and active floor management, which trust me, I understand is a pain. Um, I think if you combine those two things, if you're interested, that's a a, a reasonable way to um, uh, maybe improve yield a little bit. So, 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 Mark, uh, the competition has begun. Uh, Jason has drawn his. Uh, whiteboard yield curve. He doesn't have one. And, and you've drawn yours. You drew, um, you drew a, a frown face. Do you face. want to describe what you've drawn over there first? <laughs> My daughter's sad that I'm gone for two weeks. That's what that, is, that reflects. So. Daughter sad. He's gone. gone for we have two a ton weeks. of publishers in the room. Who else? We have uh, Washington Post. We have 
I can I can call out. Well, let's see. Let, 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 so, so what Bill was describing sounds like what I hear more often than what I heard from Art, which is we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 60 percent filter through in terms of the rest. The rest goes on to some kind of programmatic, and I use your revenue numbers. Use the microphone this way they can just hear you. Yeah, you know, I hate talking. So, uh, so 60%, let's say, you know, I, that's a good number, right, compared to what, what I'd say we hear frequently. 60% of direct, 40% of impressions, volumes, and programmatic. But if that's 20% of the revenue and that's 80, you're probably talking about a 3x uh, CPM differential and probably 3 to 4x is what we typically hear, at least from exchange to, to direct, if that's a blended programmatic number, sort of three to one would be maybe a little more reasonable, right? And just in your programmatic number, is that um, private marketplaces and open exchange, or is it also? That would just be exchange. That's probably less, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you put in the marketplace, that, that comes out a little bit higher, right? And so that would buy, yeah. why be, it'd be a three to one instead of a four to one. The right? other thing that's interesting that's happening too now is that some of that programmatic number is actually seeping over to the front side of your, coming of your into, curve. Coming yeah. into, coming At into higher direct. rates, right? It's still a small sliver. But there's that, yeah, and it's, it's moving in front. So, so if we feel confident. How is that happening? So programmatic moving to direct. Are you, is it just happening? Are you no, we finding have, those buyers and moving them over? Yeah, so in, uh, in a few cases, we've actually had, uh, we had a very large client last year actually say that they would not work with us unless we ran on a programmatic uh, guaranteed platform, All right. which was in alpha, and was, you know, was, was um, it was concerning to put a deal that large in there, but we both made a commitment that we would kind of work through issues together. And so that was great because that maintained uh, really direct CPMs. All of our programmatic guaranteed deals that we have run it rate card. And then we've, we have a few partners that we work with that, you know, we'll evaluate whether um, a lines in our ad server are going to deliver and if they can generate a higher CPM and still guarantee delivery, we'll run them ahead of our reserved So you've uh, got lines. programmatic guaranteed that are running at about the same CPMs as direct? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, right. there's no reason not to. I mean, the other, the, honestly, the conversation right now is really more, these guys want to impose some big tax on us. Do we need to pass that tax on, right? That's so we're actually talking about like rate card plus, which is ridiculous because we're talking about autom you know, making a process more efficient. So we're not doing that, but yeah, definitely not lower. So you actually, if somebody's paying that, mm -hmm. you, your demand is actually higher in your automated guarantee than it is over in your direct. It our, would our, seem your pricing, yeah, we your gross pricing are high, is higher, right? We had this conversation at one of the round tables. Our goal is to get, is to, um, have our demand forecast basically show about 180% sold through, right? And that's between all of those channels. We're trying to apply that much pressure uh, against that, that fixed set of inventory. All right, so if I move down from automated guaranteed, you have private marketplaces mm -hmm. then, or does that fill the rest of what you would call programmatic, or do you have like another flavor of, uh, uh, of north of exchange? south of automated guarantee. No, it's really automated guarantee and then the private marketplaces. And then PMP? Yep. And then those prices go from, you don't have to like give the details, but they, they go presumably from a they, fraction. They sit in between exchange. open exchange and short of direct, but they do sit closer to actually, they actually do sit closer to our rate card prices. Like okay. Pretty close. In most instances, you can set the rate or at least the floor of what you were looking for. Yeah, and we're offering to. real value. Yeah, like we're segmenting value. inventory. We're offering up like special, you know, event type inventory or uh, segmenting out audiences for them specifically, creating, creating audience profiles like off of our data for them. So PMP comes in by virtue of you're doing now audience segmentation. Mm -hmm. That's generally why they're buying that from us. Is that first party? Are you doing like first party data matches or is that pretty much just your data segmented and it meets with buyer criteria? We try to sell our data segments because we think that we can show more value uh, in doing so and differentiate ourselves a little bit. So that's what we're, at. That's what we're actively selling. It's not always what they buy, but that's our, that's our pitch. Now, are people in direct also buying audience segments or are they buying more tradi traditional with brands like ours, they're usually buying more traditional. They right. want access to uh, Dream Home Giveaway. They want access to Food Network Star. 
So they're like buying like content yeah, or they're brand buying, adjacency. Yeah, it's, it's endemic brands, right? It's Home Depot buying HGTV. It's Kraft Foods buying Food Network. They just want, they want access to the users that are understanding how to, you know, swap out a toilet or make macaroni and cheese. And then you not, say not at the same, same time. time. <laughs> not at the same time. Different shows. Yeah. Different shows. Yeah. Different shows. Yeah. And then at the top end, you said you're doing more things. You called it custom. Uh, so, yeah. like branded it's the branded contents. entertainment stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's not stuff that we could ever. You know, we we expect that the programmatic guaranteed stuff is really going to kind of consume a lot of that direct category. And so anything that sits in our product catalog, like that we have that exists in operative, you know, it, at some point we expect will exist in that environment. But the stuff on the far left is really custom. We couldn't put it in a catalog. So over time, you expect automated guaranteed to, to basically become, or direct to become programmatic or automated guaranteed? Yeah, that's right. In that, in that framework. And you'll still have, do you expect this business to grow? We hope so. Okay. Cut half the ads and raise the CPM, and get rid of the programmatic discussion. Amen. But yeah. is it is it because there are too many people in the marketplace? Is genuine? Like, I struggle with this all the time because we're not dissimilar. Sixty percent sell through logic would dictate okay, we got too many ads, so get rid of some of them, create scarcity, raise the CPM, right? Econ one hundred and one. Yep. But why doesn't that work? Because it, it doesn't. Fear. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't think that it's. I think it's really challenging. I, look, I. Um, I don't disagree, but thank you, Bill. I, I think you got it. Good job being loud too. The um, I, I think that one of the things that that's hard for uh, executive or sales teams to understand is they they will always think, okay, well next year we're going to sell next year we're going to sell 100 percent, right? So I'm not going to take away half the ads because I can do this next year. Um, the idea of doubling CPM is hard. We just, there's so much excess supply in the market that we hear, I'm, everybody hears it every day, like, well, why would I pay this? I can go get a food audience from Blue Kai on whatever ad network. Um, and, and so, but I really think, I, I think it is, um, I mean, look, how many, don't raise your hand, how many people have added a, an ad unit to their site to try and hit like a quarterly goal, and then when you get there, they're like, oh, wait, we're just going to leave it up because it's more money. Like you find yourself in this horrible cycle of, of um, honestly trying to figure out how to garner more impressions. Yeah, I um, think I, it's admirable to go to fewer, but it's that's a hard sell for. for we me. talked about that, like, I think, three years ago, Lauren. One of your, uh, I um, can't remember what event it was, but it was a smaller group, and we had that same conversation. And we said it in the room, and everyone applauded. And I really think, because I'm passionate about that question, uh, you know, back home. It's, and it's fun, two, two reasons have fundamentally, um, is what I believe are fundamentally why we can't do that. The first one is fear. It's the fear of uh, missing, missing commitments, being able to hit the LRP, the long range plan. Um, how am I incentivized? You know, I'm five years from close to retirement. Am I really gonna get, get behind a pitch like that to create a better user experience that would also help eradicate the problems we're having with ad blocking and fraud and bots and all that? Am I really willing to be a maverick and go do those things on a premium site that actually could set an expectation? No, most people aren't, aren't willing to do that. The second one is though what uh, Jason, not Jeff, hinted on this morning and you said as well and Kevin said, Value proposition, we have not done a good enough job explaining to our advertisers what it really means to advertise on our sites and the audience and who we get to and how we can get to them and how that can actually help change your business and really drive results. And because we haven't done that and, let it, and we've left it for third parties to do, we're not, only, <laughs> we're, not only, we're not only losing that that's our conversation to have with the advertisers, we're letting other people have that conversation for us and they end up getting the money. So it, it's a very bad cycle that we're in, but I do think it's, 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 it's fear and we haven't done a great job with value. I also think it's really difficult to drive a price up when you have a historical rate. We, we push ourselves into the corner when we don't flex the rate and the rate continues to come down year after year after year. The age old, I will spend more money so the increased buy drives our CPM down because we think the bulk buy is happening. And then we can never raise that price back up. Yep. And so we're stuck with that, that premium price getting degraded year over year instead of being able to push back. So I did do a drawing like Jason just to get an Apple Watch. 
I don't know if anyone cares about it, and it's okay. You don't have to. But I wanted to say to Lauren, I did draw one. You gave me pens, and I did it. Yeah. If, if you don't, and if it's you don't pretty mind, honest. Just a just a that's couple. Just, of, yeah, that's worth something. Just a, I'd rather hear. <laughs> <laughs> just a couple tiny little. I mean, tiny comments in there. It's, I mean, it's it's a fascinating conversation. I would tell you that our business is not like this right now. Um, and it's, it's pretty significantly different than this. Now, what's interesting is the, some of the same comments is the fear of moving to much more of a, um, a full programmatic or for one, and there's, that there's, a, there's a data and a currency fear that sits out there. And that's in our, that's in our advertising community that's out there that we have um, definitely a challenge and transition there. But I would tell you the same conversation that we're having is that we're not doing a good enough job talking about the value proposition of the video and what viewership and engagement actually drives for our, for our clients at that point. Um, and and it is, it's a slippery slope because I think that fear is helping us a little bit right now because if we jumped 100% into a ROI uh, metric at the end of the day, uh, I said this to a couple folks the other day, is I believe that is, a, that is the first step to kind of commoditizing of essentially what all we do. Um, our video isn't engaging, it's more of a metric and a transactional engagement that's sitting in there. And it's just like now you're competing against all the other type of delivery mechanisms without having that engagement on top. Um, and we, we say many times, I mean, impression's an impression, in my, impression's an impression, but the, <clears throat> the ability to see that impression on a television or a large screen TV or a viewing experience that's even different than maybe even a tablet or a mobile device, there's a different value between those two things. And if we end up losing that with just a metric at the end of the day, I think that's going to hurt us in this value proposition, really the, the curve that we have sitting out there. So. Yeah. Well, I think I've been hearing over the last couple of days that there's kind of two kinds of data or two kinds of uses, because I'll eat my own dog food, right? Data for the sake of data. Um, there's the value of media, right? What you're creating, the consumer connection, context, whatever the brand. And then there's audience targeted data that feel like, and I, you know, I do want to ask how much of that comes over here for everyone else, but there are two different applications, and it sounds like there's a lot of energy going over here and maybe not, not a lot of energy, certainly not a lot of coordinated energy. I know everyone probably here has some kind of a research department that talks about the, the consumer, the customer connection, but I don't know how connected that is to actual data points in terms of the media that was delivered. Um, and, and I think if we, you know, Zach, I get it, right? Like we hear a lot, there's been, I, since I've been doing it, for the last 10 years I've heard we've got to reestablish the value of brands, but, but who's doing that? Other than on a, on a very piecemeal kind of basis, right? And I was pitching for Viacom. We talk about the value of our brands constantly. We don't have endemics really for Viacom, right? That was a, that was a, a, a tougher, tougher challenge, at least in that way. Um, and we had like old school research to do this kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know if that's a form of data that's missing or if that's relevant to that conversation, but it's one that I've heard people ask for generically, I think over the last, last 48 hours, but, but not one that I've heard that, that uh, people are putting a lot of investment in or scaling. Question, comment. Harriet Dubman. <laughs> <laughs> Why is she on our feed? <laughs> Probably because of my Peyton's picture. Ah, sorry. Is that a uh, bot? Did we put a bot? <laughs> Twitter bot. Um, was it moving fast? Enough? Hey, so it's uh, Rafe from Godwin from the PGA Tour. So one thing that we've been talking about, we've got a kind of a small collective of publishers who are getting on a call once a month in terms of like getting back value of brand and kind of changing the way in which we sell. Um, we have done some of the things of taking ad units off um, to, one, we feel like it's in keeping with viewability and in keeping with the spirit of why people are blocking ads to try and you know, pare it down, but to create more. But what the group of us are getting on a call on once a month over the last couple of months has been around moving to the movement to time-based selling. And so getting away from impressions as the, as the basis for, for selling. And you know the analogy I keep using is around the grocery store doesn't sell any produce on numbers, right? They don't sell a number of apples, they sell it on pounds. And so our engagement that we're measuring through Moat and we were through Chartbeat is, is off the chart and we're not getting credit for that. We're, getting, we're not able to sell any impression that's seen for less than a second, but if it's seen for 15 seconds, we're not getting any more money. And so what we're talking about doing is changing that. And I, 
at the IB leadership, there was a, uh, I don't have anybody from Zaxxis, but Zaxxis had left a pamphlet out about the top 10 things you need about viewability, and one of them was around time-based selling. So with Moat, with Zaxxis, with a collective of publishers, we've been talking to Digital Content Next about maybe getting involved or helping us build some sort of working group, but that may be a, something to throw out there about that can change us and lift that yield ceiling back to where we can uh, get more of the value for the, for the premium brands and the engagement that we're seeing with all of our sites. Definitely agree with what you're saying. I'm gonna take it right back to, it's all probably very true, but how do you sell the value of that to the advertiser? Have you really tied it to the things that drive their business? Because if, if the user's more engaged, it should, the advertising should work. It should work at an improved rate, but tying it back in an effective way that you, that you, you control, but you can share with your advertiser without needing third parties to get in there and get it wrong. So that, that's the struggle I always have, is, you know, even with the Financial Times model of definitely bold, definitely an absence of fear, give it a shot, but have you tied it back to value for the advertiser? Engagement. That what they're wanting, I, especially from the brand side, is engagement with brand. And so I, it would seem to be that we're actually not trying to push them on a new metric, but flipping it and giving them the metric that they're asking for. Yeah, I, I, so it's, 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 this, is, this is one of our challenges, and this is a great challenge that I think we have right here. And, and what I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say something a little different, but I think it's on the exact same lines there. And you guys have all seen the, the uh, sales funnel, top of funnel, below, below the funnel in there. And I think what, um, most of our video, that premium video that I keep on talking to is the top of the funnel. It's driving the engagement, it's driving the demand, and how do you measure that more effectively? That's viewability, length and time and viewability. Those are metrics on the linear side we don't have today that we're delivering to our client. We're able to say, you saw a spot, we saw a spot at a certain time, but the amount of engagement, and, which translates to what I'd say is the bottom of the funnel ROI metrics that are there. And I think that's, it's, a, it's a very, tough place to be in at this point is that we want to stay at that top of the funnel, at least our organization wants to be at the top of that funnel, drive an engagement, measure that engagement, measure how much we're actually um, driving the, the emotional connection, as we say, to the actual advertisement and creating the demand. We also want to follow that up, and I think that's what you're hitting on, is that we want to follow that up to say, what did that actually translate at the end, though? Um, we want to be able to say that on the side, but if we only look at the bottom of the funnel, we only look at, we generated five car sales, and that's how we measure our business. We will become a commodity. <laughs> we'll absolutely be the commodity because that's how we're gonna be gauged is if we met the, the business need or not the business need on how many transactions that are there, that's one part of the sales funnel there. And so at least on our side, we are really focused on that top, saying how do we measure more effectively in the top? How do we make sure our content is the, what's driving that, um, that, uh, that, that engagement or that emotional connection that's sitting out there? And back to the, the yield curve here is that how do we want to make sure that we are utilizing our data to be able to support that across that full yield curve? Not just saying ROI metrics are on this side and engagements on this side. It should really be stretched across that whole yield curve to be able to make sure we maximize. So, so Mark, you you drew. Uh, some just vote for mine. <laughs> Is that someone you know? <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, real quick, because I know we're we're probably over. I. I Kind of mimicked uh, what Jason was doing over there just to say, so this whole box represents direct at 90%, and then I put a PMP in here and I put open X, and so I just used X as the high point of what we do in an exchange, and what we get into our private marketplace deals is seven to 15 times uh, what we would do at the top end of an open, open exchange, but as you see, our private deals actually um, oftentimes will exceed what we're getting great competition in here, which will exceed what we can do direct for some of our larger customers when we start to scale out and look at their eCPM over the volume that they're buying. But then all the way when we get to direct, you know, you're getting into the 40 to 50x of what you do at the top end uh, of the open exchange. And then if you assume everything we're doing today with audience is just table stakes and easy stuff that, that everyone does with data today, we really want to find a way to push audience and monetize and just shift the curve up. So it's not so much about, there's gonna be gaps in here and natural gaps in here depending on you know, relationships. Could you block this because of X? Can you do this because of Y? And sometimes the strategic, the strategic value of doing that in the relationship is worth more than the revenue in the short term. That long term revenue is, is more promising. So what can we do to shift the curve up instead of necessarily, necessarily fill everything in underneath? Are you still, are your PMP deals primarily non-endemics? Would they be people that 
that you would not normally, your sales team would no, normally it's call? No, most of them are endemic clients that we have existing relationships with. We'll get a, we'll get a weird one every now, like last, um, around last holiday season, for some Excel wetsuits was spending like crazy with us. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know <laughs> yeah. why. Yeah, you know, that makes, right? it, totally makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah. got it. Um, yeah, so every now and again, we'll get one that'll, um, um, that works outside, but no, like generally speaking, most of those folks, um, we may convert over from the open exchange. Like the open exchange has been a very good way for us to prospect uh, non-endemic clients. <coughs> And I was saying to somebody, the number of PMPs that we're managing now to like a year, year and a half ago, it's like, we have like 300% more than we had just like last year. Yeah. So you're using Exchange to create like a, like a bottom CPM. It's, yeah, I referred and to trying it earlier. to push that higher. It's our backstop. It's your backstop. You're yep. moving, you're trying to move, find key advertisers there, move them into private marketplace where they're primarily buying like audience segments on your, on your sites and brands, right? right? And it may be and likely the same customer, just sometimes they buy a seg, an audience target, sometimes they buy a, you know, brand sort of yep. package. Yep. And then you're seeing automated guaranteed growing, in fact, probably charging more than you are for direct. And you think that that is going to be that way. push that over. And then at the top end, you're hoping to grow that custom. Yeah, we want to take a, more of those resources that are working on the you know $50,000 IO and push them over to things that are more strategic. Yep. So we want to grow that pie and automate that middle piece, which is basically our standard ad product catalog. And Mark, you have 97% endemic sell through, so you work for Campaign problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that's a wrap. Uh, awesome stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah.